In this video, I'm conducting an interview with Dirk Scheman. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoy this video. Please like and subscribe and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and what you'd like to see in future videos so I can work on that. I appreciate your super thanks. These small donations help me continue to create the high quality content that you enjoy. And now with our new membership option, you can get exclusive access to the most popular videos. My book, Backgammon, Backgame Strategies is available. There's a link in the description to where you can get it. And if you're interested in lessons, please contact me via email. My email address is in this description. Again, in this video, it's my honor, pleasure, and privilege to be conducting with uh, an interview with Dirk Scheman by way of introduction. He's one of the best players in the world, recently achieved Super Grand Master status. He has his own YouTube channel and he's written multiple books. The first one uh, is an outstanding book, The Theory of Backgammon. We'll go into it. And also there's a new book. So I'm happy to have you. Welcome, Dirk. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my pleasure. So yeah, great. Talk to you yes, again. Yes. We had yes. the pleasure already. Yes, yes. It's always a pleasure to see you. I'm happy to have you. Um, Excited to talk a lot about backgammon and all sorts of things. Uh, as a by way of introduction, I'd like to start with a little background biographical information, if I may. Um, I know you you live in Germany now, and where were you born and raised? Yeah, that exactly where I live now. So back mm -hmm. to the roots. Uh, I live in a small town, like uh, close to Cologne in uh, Western Germany, relatively close to the Dutch border. So yeah that's uh basically yeah that's the place where i grew up so yeah uh, i lived uh, in costa rica for more than 10 years and maybe i will go back there for retirement i mean that uh, sounds appealing but right now i'm back where i started i know another top backgammon player who lives in costa rica Yes, yes, I met him actually. <laughs> yes, I met him there uh, and his wife. So yeah, Wilcox, you are talking about. Of yes, course. Wilcox Snellings. He, you know, he does stuff there. What did you What did you do in Costa Rica? Uh, I played. Uh, that was the phase where I played uh, poker professionally. Uh, so I had to fight. So my my back end actually actually was drying out. Because back in the day, it was uh, the business model was uh, playing money games and all that stuff. But for some reason that I cannot fathom, nobody wanted to play me anymore. So um, <laughs> you're too good. Uh, so then, uh, yeah, I had to find yeah something stable. And then, I mean, I got lucky. The poker boom started, and I just jumped on the train. And what I did in Costa Rica was only playing uh, online poker and. I didn't play any backgammon at all in this time. So that was my big backgammon break. Yeah, a lot of the backgammon players are playing poker nowadays. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I told you, yesterday I was playing in a tournament at the local tournament. I mm -hmm. played against the uh, 1986 Monte Carlo world champion uh, Clemente Palacci from Italy. And oh, okay. I, I I hadn't heard of him before, but he's he's living in the area, and now he plays poker because there's really no money in in backgammon. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I completely changed my business model, as you already mentioned. Uh, wrote some books, and uh, I give uh, lessons, so I still travel to tournaments. I really enjoy it, but without side action. These tournaments are more for fun and competition, but uh, it's just, I don't think you can make a living out of it. But you do primarily backgammon as a profession. You don't have like... Yeah, now, now I'm only uh, backgammon as my profession, yeah. So, but, but mainly coaching and, and book writing. And of course, I have positive equity on tournaments, but uh, if I had to live from that, uh, I think I would have quite a few of uh, sleepless nights. <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah, so, it's hard yeah. because there's a lot of expenses to travel and things like yeah, that. Exactly. And you First. at least need some sponsorship or, and the competition, I mean, uh, let's face it, there are lots of great players out there. So <laughs> I know, um, I know. I enjoy poker too, but I enjoy backgammon more because when you're playing backgammon, 
you're always making a move when you're playing poker the majority of the hands you're not even in it and mm. you're basically mostly watching and things like that so that's part of the thing that i like about backgammon more yeah for me it's also my game of choice uh, back in the day when i switched to poker it was more like for economic reasons uh, it's also the game that i i'm more talented for a backgammon that is so in poker i I mean, I was a decent poker player. I could make a living, but uh, that wasn't too difficult in the in the early days of poker, as many many people will tell you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what what kind of poker game did you play? The standard. Uh, the I, most I started out. I made my poker education in Las Vegas. I I tra always traveled to the Las Vegas backgammon tournaments, and I stayed like a couple of weeks longer to play poker. So at that time, so we are talking about end of the 90s uh, so there was only limit hold'em so i uh, my education started with limit hold'em and uh, when the poker online boom started it was also mainly limit hold'em so that's uh, uh, where my main in income came from and then i switched to uh, later i switched to pop limit omaha and i also played some no limit but uh, yeah ELO or Pot Limit Omaha is very, uh, there's a lot of volatility in, involved in that. Lots of Absolutely, big... but uh, so there is in back end. <laughs> there is, there is. I play, I, I really enjoy playing uh, Omaha uh, high, low, eight or better limit, mm -hmm. which is complicated. It's, it's more complicated than mm -hmm. because there's more, there's more to think about. Um, so, Good, good. You play a lot. You played a lot of poker. Now, now it's backgammon. Um, so that's kind of what you do. Um, and also, um, you're married, right? Yes, yes. Happily married for twenty years now. Good. So yeah. And you have kids? Uh, one son, nineteen years old. So uh, born in Costa Rica. So uh, like Wilcox, uh, my wife <laughs> is uh, Costa Rican, but we are living together in Germany now. And but we started out in Costa Rica. So. Yeah. Does he play backgammon? No, not at all. Actually, <laughs> he uh, when he was uh, like 10, 11 years old, I offered to teach him. And he said to me, and actually pretty smart uh, comment that he made for a 10-year-old. Uh, he said to me, uh, Papa, uh, no matter how hard I try, I never will be better than you so i rather rather choose uh something uh, where i can beat you uh and <laughs> so he chose uh, table tennis and he's beating me up all day long so ah I'm yes sure. you, i know you play uh, table tennis and you were telling me you play badminton yeah yeah i just came from badminton practice so yeah i need to uh, like a contrast to all this sitting in front of the screen and i really like to do sports uh, like uh, workout and uh, any sports with a racket where you can chase a ball is great. So all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a lot of fun. And exercise is good mm -hmm. for your mind too. So I feel like it helps you. Like I feel like um, recently I started uh, taking some walks with my son in the morning or sometimes by myself, which I had done a long time ago, but I hadn't done it in a long time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I have more energy throughout the day. Yeah. And even the matches that I'm playing, I'm playing better levels at. Yeah, usually when I'm on a tournament, uh, I, I'm really happy when there's a gym so that I can do some work, I clear, clear my mind before uh, the tournament day, or I'm taking walks or all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Especially very... more important when you get older and older than uh, back in the day, it was partying, gambling, <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't do that uh, like that anymore. So, yeah, I know. I know how it is. That's that's how it is when you get older. And there was that joke I told you about badminton and backgammon. And it sounds like backgammon. A lady asked her friend, what's your hobby? My hobby is a uh, backgammon. So she got him a shuttlecock for his birthday. <laughs> Because <laughs> a lot of people don't know backgammon. Um, uh, so great, great. We're happy to have you. I know you, you're, you've been one of the top players for a very long time. But most recently, I was speaking with Mochi the other day, and he said the biggest news of the year is your mm -hmm. uh, new title of Super Grandmaster. So let me see if I can pull this up. Oh, okay, here we go. 
Let me pull this up here. You able to see the screen now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this is the cover, but this is the BMAB. So now they have the titles Mochi and Dirk Schiemann as Super Grand Masters. So um, some people are not familiar with BMAB and what Super Grand Master or Grand Master or things like that are. Can you please explain to them all of this? Um, yeah, in short, um, so what is measured is not your success in tournaments, but your playing strength. And uh, the arbiter is the backgammon program Extreme Gammon, as most of uh, the watchers will know. And uh, so you, it doesn't help to get lucky, you have to play well. And these titles, uh, for these titles, you have to uh, play well or below a certain performance rating for a longer period of time. So in my uh, case, to become a super grandmaster, you have to play below uh, 2.5 PR over 300 experience points. So a seven point match, that is seven experience points. So uh, so that you get an idea, what is it? Let me calculate it. So you have to play on average below 2.5 over 43 uh, seven point matches, and then you are there. And like the other titles, so for example, we can see uh, G0, you have to do the same thing, but uh, it, you only have to play below 2.75, uh, difficult <laughs> enough to become a Grandmaster G1. You have to play below three, over 300 experience points, but there are many titles that you can get. So even if you play a 10 uh, over a certain uh, number of experience points, you can get a title. So it's a a uh, very nice thing uh, for you to uh, see where you stand and uh, it doesn't start at the very top but uh, i think the first title you can get when you play below 16 or i don't know some number so uh, it, it really helps and it keeps you honest i mean you see where you stand uh, and uh, uh, it's a great thing. Uh, the only thing is you have to record your matches. You have to send in the video or you upload the video files. So there has to be proof of your achievement. You cannot just uh, say, um, yeah, I played this and that. Here are the match files. So you have to prove it, of course. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a serious uh, thing. Right, right. It's fantastic. I think a lot of the people that are uh, the more beginner level or novice level are not aware even getting to like less than seven or six or five it's very difficult like when you when you first start playing like when you first start learning the game you're like 50 or 100 or whatever whatever it is and you know it may not that be may not be that hard to get like under 20 once you start learning but getting to these levels is very very difficult difficult and i know like when you get to these really top levels it's like you can't even make a small minor error because you know sometimes you get tired and you have an oversight mm -hmm. there's no room for that um not one much the, i mean yeah. yeah even one match yeah that's true i was talking with mochi he said well if you play for one match the next match you're gonna have to play a one to make up for it to get to 2.5 yeah, yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, I'm surprised myself that I made it. Uh, and uh, there's also a little bit luck in it, to be honest. For example, one match that was rated for BMAP, I was uh, in the match, I was staring at the two cube, I was given a two cube, I was leading in the match, I didn't know, take or pass, take or pass. So uh, finally, I made the right decision I took, but uh, I was very close to to passing and that would have been like a 600 error. So that would have killed all uh, the performance. Uh, so yeah, every once in a, of course, you can make mistakes still and, and be below 2.5. But there is not much room for error. Yeah, yeah, cube decisions can be very difficult. One of the questions the viewers really like me to ask is, Say you're at a pretty strong level, but then you want to get to the grand master level. What are the recommendations you can give to the viewers to kind of go up to the next level there? 
Yeah, uh, first recommendation, uh, be honest. So uh, look out for your weaknesses, admit your weaknesses. So that's what I'm doing all the time, looking for weaknesses and I have no problem. When I spot a weakness, I'm happy. I mean, I'm they, okay, so great. So there's, I spotted something that I can work on it. So know yourself. Uh, simple thing, for example, I noticed uh, that I'm that I was too conservative in non-contact positions, so in races. So I, I dropped too much. So now that's an these are the things that you can fix easily. So that's another thing. So focus on things that come up all the time. Yes, sometimes you will have a complicated position back game or many anchors. And yeah, then you have to navigate it through it and trust your intuition. But uh, that's not the way you really improve because it doesn't come often enough. So learn the basic stuff, um, like holding games all the time. They come up all the time. I especially focused for the Grandmaster title on early game positions because they also come up all the time. And then really get to know your biases. Uh, I recommend uh, finding a coach if you cannot find your biases yourself because uh, I'm, sometimes with my, my students, they send me a bunch of matches and I try to find as a coach patterns in their mistakes. So uh, that's the first step for sure. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I think... You know, one of the one of the things that you mentioned is, and I think people should not look at at errors in a negative way, but look at it in a positive way as an opportunity for improvement. Mm -hmm. And now they have these blunder databases, which is difficult to have. But I have some friends, like um, former world champion Hal Heinrich, he's a retired software developer, and he has this whole system where you put in a match, and it'll tell you the categories of your errors and create a blunder database. I think that's that's very useful. And I agree, like, I tell people the, the best thing to study is the most common position in backgammon, and the most common position in backgammon is the opening position, because that occurs in every single game you know people ask me like like i wrote this book on back games before that a lot of people don't know i wrote a book on the opening game um but that wasn't as detailed but i think that's much more important to study than back games they said well why did you write that one and the, the major reason why i wrote on that topic is because there are no other books about that there are a lot mm -hmm. of books about opening and, and other things um so great that that's fantastic now speaking of books you have written now multiple books um the first one um, was the theory of backgammon which i actually have right here this is an outstanding book and i keep it by my bed um so i try to read a little bit every night i've read it multiple times and it's an outstanding book i also have my book by my bed i read that and it helps me fall asleep um, but, <laughs> but this one, this, the first book that you wrote, the theory of backgammon is a completely different book than all the other books that have been written about it. Um, I think it's an outstanding book. It is very technical and math oriented. So you really have to understand that well. Um, but I'm the kind of person that is, I've read it multiple times. You have to read it multiple times to be able to digest it. Um, Tell us, uh, what made you come up with the idea of writing a book like that? Uh, first uh, first of all, it wasn't me. <laughs> so <laughs> it was uh, my friend, uh, Matthias Krings, who uh, uh, I met in a seminar that I gave in Switzerland. Uh, so he really is the theory guy. And he made uh, like a, a great lecture on all these theory thing match theory things and the powerpoint like uh, it was like an eight hour le lecture over two or three days and uh, when the covid crisis started he approached me and said uh, to me uh, he wanted to put that lecture into a book he wanted to call it the mathematics of backgammon. So I, I, I said to him, okay, if you 
want to make sure to 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 be for the sales to be in the single digits and then call it like that <laughs> uh, no it's uh, not kidding so basically we made an agreement uh, that uh, he starts out with the theory parts and I put the meat to the bone, like the practical applications and just make it uh, digestible. And, but then, I mean, he has a regular regular job and the project got a little bit out of hand. It, it's just so much bigger than we both expected and so much yes. more in it. So in the end, uh, I took it over, but it wasn't a hostile takeover. So. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and uh, but the many many of the ideas are also from Matthias so I have to I mean uh, he deserves the credit and some chapters are still I mean I mentioned it in the introduction and the acknowledgments some chapters are basically from him uh, so that's where I came into it so it was uh, um, the idea of a friend um, but then I really enjoyed it. And I think, or, I mean, that book could have been written 20 years ago. And when I came back to Backgammon after a 13 year break, I was rather surprised to find that nobody has, hasn't written yet something like that, because I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. The, the, I mean, you have to agree, most of the things uh, were there before, like for a long time, but nobody uh, put in the effort to just uh, develop the theory and uh, yeah, make a, yeah, make a work, make a, like a work that covers everything, uh, what, uh, with regard to cube action and the theory behind that and uh, yes i know it's not easy and but it's just derived from the rules of the game and so uh, i feel like only being the messenger so these are the rules <laughs> that follows from it and what can i do yes it's a bit complicated but it's still school math and i always uh, uh, emphasize uh, you don't need to look at the formulas i mean just if if that is not your cup of tea forget about the formulas just read the text and the application so i feel sometimes people get scared of all the formulas and then uh, uh, don't uh, take in all the value bits valuable bits of practical information that are also there there so but yeah, yeah, it's 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 great. I know there's you know it's not like it's new. There's not a lot of new stuff um, other than the fact that we have all this these stronger computer programs mm -hmm. that we did not have 20 years ago. I spoke with uh, Neil Kazaros one time, and he said he could have written that this book because yeah, he has absolutely. all these things like done 40 years ago. Um, so and you know part of the things that I do is primarily because of your book. It's like looking at the next sequence, thinking about what are going to be the next 21 or 36 rolls by the opponent and the next same number by you and, and looking at this. And this is part of the reason why I expanded the dice distribution feature. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just rereading a part of your book and you, you kind of just talk about that. Like you have these little bar graphs that go up or down and you have 1,296 of them and you make a sum. So, you know, I made these things and I have them for checker play. And I don't know if you've seen the ones I've developed for cube action, but it's basically the same as what's in your book. Mm -hmm. So um, I can show that to you. So that's fantastic. The other thing that I was going to mention that that you you said like during the COVID pandemic, what what I say is obviously it's terrible and we would never want it to repeat. But I like to think about some of the positive things. And one of the positive things is during that time, a lot of people were home and people had time to write books. People had time to play online on Backgammon Galaxy and Heroes. So it, in that sense, it you know increased the popularity of Backgammon, I believe. So there were a lot of good books written during that time. Yeah, sure. During lock time, there's just uh, there are just so many things that you could do can do uh, almost nothing. So uh, yeah, sitting in front of your 
computer and writing something or playing or studying was one of the things things that you could do of course yes so yeah, that yes. Time, it was really helpful and it helped me improve my game and uh, yeah so it's uh, nothing is just black and white there's yeah really also some good thing within the bad thing right right uh, i remember also like when you say black and white, they're, they're, you know, you read about the double take decision and then you have to think about a market losing sequence. And it's one thing to count the number of market losers if you have like a series of roles, but it's not only the number of market losers, it's also the magnitude of the yeah. market loss because it's like, it's like a vector, a, a, a direction and a magnitude, right? So if you have fewer market losers, but they are high in magnitude. You just read the chapter on volatility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, the people uh, were uh, too focused yeah, on the number of market losers always. I, I feel like with O'Hagan's law, you need, need 25% and this stuff, it's fine, but uh, it uh, forgets about one dimension, about the magnitude. Right. So you say, so uh, that's as as important of course yeah and those those are really big swings like when i was doing rollouts for back games you get like really big swings on some of those mm -hmm. um so good that's that's a fantastic book i'm going to put a link in the description where people can get the book um also the other thing is you you give lessons right if mm -hmm. people are interested what's the best way for people to contact you yeah also via my my web page there 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 you you can click on lessons and you can just uh, make an inquiry and ask so now uh i like uh, in may and now that the book project is over basically i will have a bit more time to take on new students so yeah just uh, on the web page uh, you can find something or just uh, write me a message uh, via Facebook, okay. Messenger. So I'll put a link. I'll put a link in the description to your website, and your book is on there. And then, um, not only was that just one book that was outstanding, now you just completed the second book uh, regarding hitting. And I wanted to uh, express my gratitude to you here in person for allowing me to be uh, one of the proofreaders. It's, it's really yeah, thank you very much. I also want to express my gratitude. Uh, I found some quite a few mistakes and uh, made very good suggestions to improve the book. Yeah, most most of them that, that I noticed were just kind of like typos and things like that, but but it's always good to, to improve that. Um, and, you know, I believe it's like this whole community online, whether it's on social media or elsewhere, has given me the opportunity to meet people like yourself and others and make these uh, valuable friendships for me. So So I appreciate that. Um, so let's talk about the, the second book. It's it's called To Hit or Not to Hit. That's the question, right? Yeah, yeah that's indeed the question. And uh, I wrote it uh, because I found that, I mean, in the process of learning, studying, that uh, categorizing positions that so many of my biggest uh, mistakes uh, were about uh, about this topic, whether to hit or not. Uh, and uh, so I thought uh, I combined this, uh, my own study with, uh, yeah, just uh, also trying to produce something that might be useful for others. And so, uh, so that's how that uh, 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 books project uh, started out. It's, it's a really big project to write a book. I mean, like I know from personal experience, it, it, it just takes... Mm -hmm a long time and a lot of effort because there's a lot of things people don't realize um, that you have to do. Um, and then when you publish the book, they say, well, what's your next book going to be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a break first. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm, I need a break too now. I mean, I will probably start uh, investigating a bit, collecting positions that might be candidates for an for the next one but uh, for now i'm done right right so there's there's two volumes right yeah yeah i will uh, i will i intend to publish a second volume because i quickly noticed uh, 
that's just uh, too too big of a topic uh, too too many aspects to it to 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 fit into one one volume only it is a very big topic it's a very good topic because there's never been another book that's written about that i really like the idea of like having a book on a topic that has not been covered in other books um so people are asking about it and Having proofread it, I tell people this is an outstanding book. People are going to really enjoy it. Um, the the first book, the theory was was very good, uh, but this one's going to be more towards I think a broader audience, people that are not so mathematically inclined, but just like understanding all this stuff can get you from one level to the next level. Yeah, more um, practice oriented, and as you said, I wanted to. Show that I also can write a book without formulas, and it, I really enjoyed it because, uh, like when you uh, when I wrote the theory, I mean that's basically all this follows from the rules of the game. So you're a bit handcuffed. So uh, some things just are as they are. It is what it is. So and now uh, writing a book about checker play and analyzing stuff and trying to formulate the rules of thumb gives you more freedom. So actually in the end, uh, I don't know if I enjoyed, enjoyed it more writing this, but it was different and it, it was really uh, yeah, nice to, to do something different. Yes, yes. So, I mean, people are gonna wanna, wanna get your book. So this is your opportunity to promote it. Like what's, what's the number one reason someone should get this, the new book about hitting? Um, I think uh, it uh, improves the understanding of the game, I mean, of your game. I mean, you, you won't get everything right. I mean, that's nobody does. But uh, uh, the first step uh, to improve is to know all the factors that play, play a role in decision making. And uh, so the book is certainly helping you with that and it i i think it also helps you i hope it helps you to analyze uh, positions better because it's all what i do and what i strict really use in this book is uh, show a position explain it and then change the position slightly so the factors change i mean you know this because you read it because Almost any position comes with the sister position. And like with a combination of two positions, you can draw much better conclusions for why something is correct. Because it doesn't help, let's say, to know all the opening responses uh, without knowing why. Because then you are not able to apply the, that to, to, to other positions. So, uh, yeah, I think it, it helps... Uh, really in the general understanding yeah i think that's really important and that's something i really appreciate about your book you make a small modification and if you notice in my book i did a lot of that too mm -hmm. and people always ask me oh well you play xg but how can you learn because it cannot speak to you well it does not mm -hmm. speak to you but when you modify the position and you see a different result that's the answer mm -hmm. that tells you why this was right or wrong yeah and also you can test yourself uh um uh, your understanding of the game i do that all the time and i mention it uh, at one point at the in the book uh, you have a position and now you make a and you see the equities what is the best move now you uh, you make a variation of the position and uh, first you should guess try to guess in which direction the equities move and for example, when I make this change and predict, oh, now I should hit with this change and I was wrong. So that's that shows me I misunderstood the position. There's something wrong in the model of the game that I have in my head. And so that is also how you get better or how you notice flaw or uh, uh, spots uh, where you don't understand the game well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there was a position that you wanted to discuss in the book, and th this will really demonstrate things well for the viewers. So let me pull this up here. Okay. Are you able to see the screen now? Yes, I'm able to see the screen. And 
but it it's black. I mean, the dice are white, but it's black rolling, right? Oh yes, I think these these ones that I, I the the checkers that I selected come like this. Yeah, they, this okay, so it's uh, okay, so it's six two for black, just to and yeah. So as an introduction, this is a money game. Um, you're playing black um, at the bottom. The opponent is white at the top. You're bearing off to the right, um, mm -hmm. and black has one checker on the bar. Hopefully, people can see it. And black has a six two to play from the bar. And of course, the two is forced. And then you have the decision of the six. And I'll let you explain it. And I and we'll look at the. Um, different positions, different um, choices, and also the sister position afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this this is a, a typical position that I get wrong. So back to uh, how I study, uh, I notice that I'm constantly, not constantly, but often overlook uh, tactical plays and that I'm playing too positionally because, I mean, this is a, obviously a prime versus prime position. So in the original i just mechanically entered with the two and played the six down so because yeah that's what you do in a priming position but as it turned out uh, entering and hitting on the ace is is a much better play i i can't remember now but i think uh, playing 13 7 is almost a blunder or even a blunder yeah, so yeah here you can see i in the book there is always the full rollout but it's but it's actually a big mistake, and this is uh, what the I would call a tempo hit. And uh, the theme here is uh, the the blot on the slot on on White's four point. So um, by hitting, uh, you can turn an asset into a liability. So uh, meaning wow. by that I mean. Uh, when you ask white now in this position before rolling do i want to have the blot on the, on my four point or do i rather want it to have on my six point let's say uh, white should say oh let's move it on my six point because now that white is on the bar white will have real, real trouble covering it so that means uh, the blot the hitting turns the blot from an asset into a liability because if you play make the other move uh, like 13 7 and then you ask white uh, do i want to have the blot on my four point or rather move it back to my six point white would say no no i want to have it there because that's a slot for the six prime so i white has very good chances to make the six prime so by making this tempo play uh, and uh, completely changing game plans, uh, you you actually turn an asset into a liability for for your opponent, which is of course a good thing for you. So uh, these these plays, uh, these positions, when I make a mistake like that, uh, I collect them in my database. So I already have uh, lots of material to work to work with uh, when writing the book that made it certainly easier. So all my my own mistakes. That's, that's great. I know like you mentioned assets and liabilities, and this is something that was kind of reinforced when I was reading Bill Roberti's new books uh, about playing the opening. And he talks about thinking about every aspect of a position in terms of whether it's an asset or a liability. So that's fantastic. We'll look at the sister position mm -hmm. next. And then afterwards, uh, what I wanted to ask you for the, the viewers is what is a tactical play versus a strategic play? Mm -hmm. We'll go through that in a moment, but let's look at the um, companion position, a variant position where now this uh, checker, as you mentioned, instead of being on the four point or the 21 point, mm -hmm. it's on the six point or the 19 point. And now there's a six two to play. Um, otherwise, it's the same position. Yeah. And now um, there's less, less need for a tactical play because the, the, the threat, I mean, White is still threatening with uh, some rolls to make a six prime, but there are far fewer rolls. So there is. Uh, I mean, black can just uh, continue with the uh, with the, with the priming game plan. Black black is doing fine, and basically there is no need for an anti-positional play, or the tactical reason is not there. I mean, by tactics, um, 
is meant uh, what's happening on the next sequence, basically. So, uh, so here the tactical and strategic is more long term. So, strategic mm -hmm. is about game plan. So, my game plan is priming, blitzing. So, here, if you look at the position and look at Black's nice prime, certainly Black's game plan sh should be priming. So, and here there's no tactical need to to give up that that priming plan because white is not threatening enough. So, if you plus plus this position. I, uh, you can see now uh, the normal play thirteen seven is by far uh, the best move, and uh, nothing special here. But uh, just move that checker to white's four point, and then you have to hit because that is a tactical opening for you. And now, uh, twenty five percent uh, with the blood there of the time white dances and white will be really under pressure. So you uh, should uh, not uh, pursue the positional priming plan, but uh, do the short term tactical play and hope simply that white won't hit, hit back. So then you have all the threats uh, hitting, blitzing, and uh, basically you give up on the priming plan in the end, but only when the blot is there. Yeah, this is fantastic. I think people can learn a lot. This is the second play here. They can learn a lot from your explanation about these two positions. And um, the book is full of this kind of material. So this is fantastic. One of the things I think about when I'm thinking of, of a prime versus prime is usually if you're in a prime versus prime position, um, all, all else being equal, if you have a longer prime, that's better. So if white is trying to make a six prime, that will be better. Um, also, the other thing I think about is all else being equal in a prime versus prime situation. The person with the more timing who's behind in the race um, has an advantage. Yeah. But these are things like you say, the white is threatening more to make the full six prime when it's slotted than when it's not. So that's very important. Yeah. And you have something to shoot at uh, when uh, right. white dances. So, uh, like uh, the main reason why why I made the mistake in the original was, uh, I mean, when you look at the the pip count, uh, black is doing fine behind in the race. Uh, timing is okay, so you don't feel the need. Uh, or and these are plays that I tend to overlook, or probably I'm not alone. Uh, because it just feels so so awkward hitting on the ace when you have a, a prime. Uh, right. I mean, here is, so this is more like the yeah, like this. Uh, it's it's tough to find these plays. So now I'm, I mean, they are not always right, of course, and you shouldn't go to the other extreme. But uh, by writing the book, I learned to pay more attention at least and always take these into account because sometimes they are just, I don't have them on the radar. Yes, this is, this is good. I know a lot of people have these general guidelines, like when in doubt, double, when in doubt, take, when in doubt, hit. But mm -hmm. what you really need to do is when in doubt, figure it out. And that's what yeah. the book will help people do. Yeah. Um, so good. This is an outstanding book and it should be out sh soon, right? Yeah, uh, I'm planning. I mean, the script went to the printing house and they told me, uh, that by the 15th of May, uh, it'll be published. Uh, uh, my my distributor in the States, that's uh, Roberto Litzenberger, as soon as I uh, get the copies, I will send them to him. So you can either order them uh, on my webpage, but also then from Roberto. So um, plenty of options uh, right. to, to get it. Great. He is fantastic. He does a lot for backgammon, both in terms of selling books. He has videos. He does a lot of recordings and things like this. I'm going to do a video about the BMAB Players Cup with him. Now, mm -hmm. speaking about videos, the next uh, thing I wanted to talk about is um, here. This is <laughs> your YouTube channel. And let me actually um, put it up over here like this. This is the uh, light background. Are you able to see that now? Yes, yes. I, so I am. You've had. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. You're familiar with it, of course. Um, you've had a YouTube channel for, for some time, but recently you've become more active and you've been doing like with the stream champs and doing all yeah. these videos. They're very popular. Um, and 
you know, part of the reason why I started the YouTube channel is because I know backgammon is a visual game. So having videos will help promote it. Um, so tell us a little bit about your YouTube channel, please. Yeah, I mean, that was another like, like, like many other things in my life that was also more like uh, uh, happened, uh, uh, not entirely by accident, but I just got the idea since I play uh, training matches, practice matches, I play on the W uh, uh, BIF and uh, all these uh, tournament matches and so uh, and I'm playing them anyway so it doesn't cost me much to just uh, commentate on what I'm doing and explain my decision process uh, so these were the very old ones but mm -hmm. so uh so I started uh, with one practice match that uh, my usual practice match on Galaxy. Uh, I I then recorded it and posted it and I got very good reactions. And I thought, okay, people really like this. So uh, it doesn't cost me oh, much to ones, use yeah. it. And now I'm playing again the online world championship. And uh, so I'm now I'm commentating everything that I'm playing uh, and uh, 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 talk about my thought process and then uh, in the end uh, I discuss the most important decisions. It's also uh, again helps me to improve because then I have it on re on the record what I was thinking when I made the blunder and so I can figure out what went wrong in my thought process. So yeah, I'm having a lot of fun doing these and I will continue producing these. Of course like with these uh, world championship matches, probably it costs me a little bit of equity because time settings, I mean, time is short and yes, and, and uh, talking and English is not my native language and thinking and playing, but uh, I got used to it and I feel like it doesn't hurt my game much. So I will just continue with that. Yes, this is fantastic. I've done... Uh, many of these uh, by myself playing and with others and it's kind of like a almost like a mixed blessing because you have to convey your thought process so it kind of uh, it makes it a little more difficult to focus because when you're just playing you're thinking in your head and you're able to do it but when you have to vocalize it it's a little bit more challenging but at the same time they say if you really understand something, you're able to teach it. So mm -hmm. if you're stating it out loud, I feel like that's helped me actually improve because I'm like yeah. talking it, talking my way through it. And it's just like logical. So in that sense, it's a little helpful. Yeah. I play, I don't, I don't use a clock. So when you have the time settings, it, it will be more challenging, but mm -hmm. those are a lot of fun. And I think the, what you're doing and what others are doing in stream champs and elsewhere is really helping to promote backend and so thank you for that yeah yeah and it's also like uh, as you said when you uh, understand something uh, or then you should be able to explain it to others uh, on the flip side when you are struggle to explain something maybe there's a leak in the game maybe there's something that you don't understand and like that you find out then you can learn. That's what I do in, in my videos. Like I'll look at the errors and then I'll modify the position, like maybe like maybe too many times for the viewers, but <laughs> I'll modify the position, I'll modify the score, I'll modify mm -hmm. all sorts of things. So it's a good opportunity for improvement. Mm -hmm. Um so that was fantastic. We were able to talk about you becoming a super grandmaster, your books, your YouTube videos. Uh, before we conclude, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, maybe your upcoming schedule. You're going to any tournaments coming up this year, or what are some of your favorites? Yeah, oh, actually, uh, on Wednesday, so in two days, I'll be going to to Greece to the Lutraki tournament. So now, after the book project is finished, I'm again have more time to play tournaments. I'm really looking forward to it. So, so nice. I will meet Mochi. I think on Wednesday they set up uh, an exhibition match. So the first clash of two super grandmasters before it was, wasn't possible uh, for obvious reasons. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited to join the tournament circuit again and then I will go to the German Open. That's the biggest tournament in Germany. Should be really big this this year, like 300 players. And 
So then the book will be ready already. So I will have the trunk of my car full of books. And <laughs> that's in May and uh, June, I don't know yet, uh, but I will next stop will be uh, Stockholm, the World uh, uh, yes. Team Championship. I will be there uh, for a week and also make some vacation with, with my wife. So combine that with, with a bit of work, vacation. And then I will take tournaments as as they come. So how I feel, because for me, they are really, I mean, they're a lot of fun, but I, after after a one week tournament, I'm usually exhausted. So I will True. take them. I, I'm probably playing fewer tournaments than, than, than other top players, but I just play as many. So as I, so that I feel comfortable, but now, uh, since I haven't played for a while, I'm really, it's really itching and I'm really looking forward to play uh, in, in a couple of days. Yeah, that, that should be really exciting. I, I spoke with Tony Diamantidis uh, and Arda Findiklu about that tr tournament in Lutraki. I know we did speak about the uh, tournament in Los Angeles in June. If you can make it, I know you have uh, some some other things you need to take care of, but we'd always be happy to see you. Mm -hmm. Wishing you the not best. Not in December. <laughs> not in December. If if not in June, in December, because oh, yes. the sales, I, I will be probably quite busy because now all the sending of the books and uh, I mean, when the book, my experience tells me when the book is out, that's the time where it's really busy and uh, answering emails and uh, yes. sending books which is also a lot of fun and uh, i enjoy it but uh, probably it will be difficult to 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 go go away for a week or 10 days or something right 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 i understand yeah. if you ever you know want to come here i'll arrange a book signing for you um at the tournament uh yeah, so thank you Thank you very much um, for your time. I know it's late for you, so I appreciate that you accommodated me um, with my schedule. We did talk a lot about a lot of different things. Congratulations on all of your achievements. I spoke with Mochi the other day, and he said you becoming a super grand master is the biggest news in backgammon for the entire year. So um, very, very job. Well done and well deserved. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Alex, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure to have you. You're always welcome to come back. Uh, you have an open invitation. Hopefully we can play a match uh, when you return yeah. from your tournament. Do you have any final comments on anything that you wanted to mention before we conclude? No, uh, I'm fine. Nothing occurs to me. Uh, I'm very happy uh, how things are going right now. I mean, I will call it positive stress. So I was very busy, but uh, it all went uh, very well so far. And uh, so, yeah, uh, things, things, things are going fine. Uh, so uh, let's see how everything will continue. And I'm really uh, looking forward to meet all the, the players in, in Lutraki in a couple of days. Yes, yes, fantastic. And I notice um, you have the perfect setup in your room. You can be on your computer and then you have your beautiful backgammon board right behind and you have your coffee yeah. right there. So everything is uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have some live students from Germany. So we play and analyze and I record everything like as a, maybe that's a good thing to finish. Uh, so any match that you play and don't analyze is a complete waste, in my opinion. I mean, it might be fun, but if you want to improve, really play, analyze, play again. And if you just play and don't look at it, it's fun, but it doesn't improve you. Yeah, that's the same thing that Mochi said. He said, if you want to improve... Uh, spend more time analyzing the matches and studying than playing it yourself. Um, so great piece of advice. Um, and that's, is that one of those Gammoner boards? Is that the Paul McGreal one? Yeah, it's, it's the same style. It's not the official Paul, Paul McGreal, but it's uh, the same colors and same checkers and everything. It's really beautiful. I'm, I'm going to schedule a, a video with um, Volker and uh, Jeff Proctor. Yeah. To this yeah, very nice guy. Actually, he lives very close, like a one hour uh, drive from here. So I picked that up from his place. Yeah, a lot, a lot of great people in backgammon in Germany. Of course, yourself, 
Volker who makes it. I, I know there's uh, Basil Tellermez who makes the FTH boards, and you know, I'm friends with uh, Marcus Reinhardt, Tobias Helwag, uh, Reiner Beerclay, and I'm sure there are many more. But you guys do a fantastic job um, in backgammon. So keep up the good work. Uh, Thank good you. luck with everything. Uh, we'll go ahead and conclude the video. Thank you again uh, very much to my good friend Dirk Scheman for joining me. Thank you to the viewers for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe, and you'll be notified every time I upload a new video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and what you'd like to see in future videos so I can work on that. I appreciate your super thanks. These small donations help me continue to create the high quality content that you enjoy. And now with the new membership feature, you can have access to the most exclusive videos. My book, Backgam and Backgam Strategies, is available. There's a link in the description to where you can get it. I will also put links where you can get Dirk's books. If you're interested in lessons from me, please contact me via email and if you're interested in lessons from Dirk, uh, I'll put a link in the description to his website where you can contact him. I look forward to seeing everyone in future videos. And until then, keep rolling your dice.